الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters in Islam Many many people in the world today as you may be very familiar with they view religion and faith as something outdated irrelevant and pointless it has been said and some people still feel that religion is the opiate of the masses a tool to control society and a cause of discord and division without benefit and not suited for the modern world Today's modern world, we have science, we have development, we have more information or access to it than ever before. In recent times, religion, in particular Islam, has come under great scrutiny and pointed out as the source of blame for many of the challenges that the world faces today. Those challenges we are all well acquainted with. This movement that has singled out faith and in particular Islam, it is not only found here in the secular West, but it has made its way through various avenues to the homelands of the believers. This way of thinking it serves now as a great test for the Muslim population. A great test for the Muslim population. Particularly so with the youth. Historically, if you look at cultures and nationalities that historically in the past were challenged with the same thing, a move to secularize and abandon religion, you will find that it was the youth that were affected most severely. And when they grew up, we see the fruits of that, if you will, we would say the rotten fruits of that, where they adopted that secular view of life, abandoned their faith, and they kept it into their old age. Our youth today face a very similar challenge, and I'm talking about here. I'm talking about right here in our own community. It has been this challenge, a reason for people to doubt their faith, to doubt Islam, to doubt the Quran, to doubt the Prophet ﷺ. It's a cause that weakens convictions and threatens our ideals. People are seeking to replace it, to replace that faith-based 
perspective with self-governance, meaning to, to govern ourselves, meaning to make decisions based upon nothing more than the whims and the desires of the weak and fallible human heart. What feels good? What feels right? What feels fair? Subject to change. Just as quick and powerful as the wind blows. As Muslims, we cannot give in to such rhetoric, nor can we let it go unchallenged. We cannot let it weaken our resolve. It is of paramount importance that we are certain that we possess a level of certainty in our faith, in its truthful nature and divine origin. It is from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truth. And His message, the Quran, is min sifatihi. It's from His characteristics, His speech, and therefore it is infallible. It is perfect. It is not subject to change or argumentation. This is something that we must hold in our heart without a shred of doubt. We must know that Islam is not outdated. It is not irrelevant, nor is it pointless. It's not a means of discord. It's not a means of division, nor is it without benefit. It is not unsuited for the modern world. But Islam, as was during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu still is till this very moment the solution. It's a timeless way of life, international in application. It's not restricted to a particular region of the world, but it is suitable for everyone, everywhere. It's a means to achieving harmony and unity. It's filled with great benefits to improve human experience, to improve our lives in this world, and most importantly, to secure our lives in the next. It enjoins upon mankind all that is good and prohibits them from all that is evil. This is the thing that we're facing right now. An aspect of that challenge is defining what is good and what is evil. Who defines that? Is it subjective? Can we argue what is inherently good and evil? This is part of the fundamental challenges that we face. Islam It provides a very clear and absolute definition of these two things. It tells us without a doubt what good is and what evil is. Islam is not from the works of mankind. Mankind who does not have a true, in their moral compass, does not have a true north. If you look at the morals of mankind in a secular world, you will find very quickly that their morals were not absolute. What was good today was evil yesterday. What was good yesterday has become evil today. There's no sense of certainty, nor is there any stability in that. But it is all subject to the desires of the heart. Islam, it is based on divine guidance. And it carries with it lofty objectives. These lofty objectives of Islam, they seek to preserve 
the general welfare of mankind, to bring about great benefit in the lives of every human, not just the faithful, but those who have yet to embrace Islam. And it also seeks to protect them from harm and vice. It seeks to insulate society from evil and all forms of corruption. There's been much said about this particular topic, the aims and objectives of Islam. One of the great, I should say one of the greats of our faith from the masters of the Islamic sciences, Al-Iz ibn Abdul Salam, one of the imams of the past, talks about this in detail. He was one of the pioneers, if you will, in this particular field of study. One of the pioneers. He says, وَلَوْ تَتَبَعْنَا مَقَاسِدَ مَا فِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ If we were to look at and follow, to research, the aims and objectives found in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Wali ilmina and Allah Amara bi kulli khairin. Dekahu wajalla. And knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered everything which is good, whether it's something very, very small and seemingly insignificant, to the goodness that is very well clear and apparent. Wazajara an kulli sharrin dekahu wajalla. And he has prohibited and warned against every evil. That which seems insignificant and that which is very clear and apparent. He says, فَإِنَّ الْخَيْرَ يُعَبِّرُ بِهِ عَنْ جَلْبِ الْمَصَالِحِ He says that the good that is referred to in the Qur'an, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions good, what is good? How is good defined? What is goodness? What is wholesomeness? How is that defined? It means in the Qur'an, when Allah is talking about khair, it means the procurement of benefit. Masalih. That which will be a benefit to society. That which will reform and rectify the condition of man. And it includes wadar al-mafasid, coupled together to remove, to expel, to protect from mafasid, corruption and evil. This is khair, as defined by our tradition and Islam. Our faith defines khair as procurement of benefit and good and the protection from evil and hardship or transgression. So, وَشَرُّ يُعَبِّرُ بِهِ عَنْ جَلْبِ الْمَفَاسِدِ وَدَرْءِ الْمَصَالِحِ The opposite is said about evil. Evil we have to look at these things in comparison to what we are experiencing around us. Evil is to bring about corruption and sin. It is to seek that. It is to promote that in society, in the lives of individuals and at the community level. To seek sin and transgression, corruption and evil. And to push away and to expel benefit. This can be clearly seen throughout the Quran. This is, the, this is a theme that runs throughout the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In all of the laws, the legislation, the rulings, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states in numerous ways the wisdom behind the legislation, which is to bring about benefit and to prevent harm. The great Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, also in great length talked about the, the wisdom behind Allah's legislation. What are the benefits that are found in the law of Islam? Sometimes, if we are not intrigued with our faith and engaged, we will take it as mere doctrine and dogma, just it is what it is. I don't see any benefit, they just make me do yes, make me do no, 
it becomes dry. This is not a this is not ingredients to a sustainable life of faith. But we should seek out the understanding of our faith, what it is asking of us, whether to do or to avoid, and the benefits that are achieved from that. Imam al Qayyim, he says that in his book, he says, I would mention them. I would mention these benefits if they were in the hundreds, but they are in the thousands. The benefits found in the law of Allah, in the legislation of Islam, the benefits, they are in the thousands. Imam Al-Iz ibn Abdul Salam, we go back to him, this pioneer of scholarship. He says, the most comprehensive verse, though there are many, he also concludes the same thing, that the Quran is filled, the Sunnah is filled with high and lofty objectives and aims. But the most comprehensive verse in the Quran, he says, لِلْحَثِّ عَلَى الْمَصَالِحِ كُلِّهَا وَالزَّجَرِ عَنِ الْمَفَاسِدِ بِأَسْرِهَا قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ In this chapter, Surah Al-Nahl, that comprehensive verse, that it encourages and guides people to benefit al-masalih the benefit that can be obtained and warns people from corruption and evil is found in this verse verse number 90 surah al-nahl that allah indeed he enjoins al-adl justice wal ihsan its diligence benevolence wa ita'i dhil qurba giving to relatives and family وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ and he prohibits he prohibits immorality and bad conduct and oppression and he admonishes you that perhaps you will be reminded this is the nature of our faith it is relevant and will continue to be so it is of great benefit Benefit that will not be found in the hands of mankind. Security and stability that is timeless. Brothers and sisters, in order to achieve true benefit and to remove harm and corruption, the sharia, the Islamic law, it carries with it a very practical code of law. It's a very practical and realistic code of law, a set of morals and standards and expectations for mankind. It is based upon divine wisdom. It addresses the basic nature of mankind. The Islamic law addresses our basic nature. The basic nature of man is as it was. We are as a people who we were from the beginning of our existence. We still wake up and we still go to sleep. We are still hungry and we still eat. We still seek companionship. We still seek offspring. We look for means of survival and sustenance. We have to live with one another in a society and community. All of the basic elements, the very essence of the human being and our needs, they are as they were. And they will be addressed. And they will be, the problems that we face, they will be solved in the same way that they were from the very beginning of Revelation. 
brothers and sisters, our guidance found in the Islamic law, the Quran and the Sunnah, it addresses us for who we are and guides us to our full potential of who we should be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, Surah Al-Anfal, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu stajibu lillahi wa lirrasul idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. He says, O oh, you who believe, respond to Allah and the Messenger when He calls you to that which gives you life. Says, either da'akum lima yuhyikum. If you are called to that which gives you life by Allah and His Messenger, you must respond. What does it mean to give you life? Imam al Bukhari, the great Imam of Sunnah, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says lima yuhyikum, what gives you life, it means lima yuslihukum. That which will reform you and bring about benefit. It will bring about your benefit. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله والحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيك ما يحب ربنا ويرضى ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. This challenge that we are facing, it is very very real. We see it all the time. Some of us live with it every day. It is all over the media, the news. The internet, the papers, challenging the Muslim world internationally, sometimes unfairly. We are up to a challenge. There's no problem with that. We should not expect to go unchallenged. We were up for that. But the tactics that are used, the means that are employed, they can be very deceptive and very tricky. And that is not without purpose and intent. This was something that was done early on among the munafiqun of the ummah during the time of the Prophet wasallam, the hypocrites that were among the companions, secret agents, if you will, of evil and corruption, employing tactics of deception and confusion trying to mislead and misdirect the faithful, to put doubt in their hearts so that they would turn away from faith and back to the old ways of ignorance. Those tactics are still being used today. Some of them are so subtle that we may not be able to identify them. But we'll even welcome them into our lives. If you own a television and it's hooked up to a cable box then you'll note a theme in many many shows and movies that has been commonplace for the last 20 or so years more so in the last 15 there's the good guy and there's the bad guy the bad guy is typically portrayed as you can fill in the blank. Looks like you, sounds like you, talks like you. And when they're in the middle of their plotting and planning of evil, you hear in the background what? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You hear the call to prayer and success. This is a very, very tricky tactic. Our children are more susceptible to such things. They are exposed and often do not have the tools. They're not equipped with the tools to be able to distinguish one from the other and to identify this. But it becomes an association. It becomes an association of backwardness and evil. There's no doubt that the challenge is largely faith-based. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous verse, He says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, stajibu. O you who have faith, then answer. That's a prerequisite that you have faith. And your faith must not be built upon doubt. It cannot be built upon doubt or uncertainty. The argument, it revolves around who is more suitable to determine what is right and wrong. Who is more suitable to establish judgment? Us or Allah? To whom should we look to define morality? Things are happening very quickly today along those lines. Things are being challenged today very quickly along the lines of morality. What is moral? One year ago to today, one week ago to today, things change. They flip and they flop. What source should we use to govern ourselves? Brothers and sisters, Islam, not only is it a call to true belief and doctrine, to the worship of Allah alone, it's not simply doctrine, it's not simply Iman in Allah, that He is the only Lord and Creator, but He should be worshipped, that we should pray and fast and give charity. These are all pillars of our faith, of course, but this is not the only thing that our faith comprises of. But Islam offers man a superior way of life, all-encompassing and all-inclusive. So to address this challenge that we face and the challenge that our children face, we must be certain ourselves by removing any doubt or skepticism that may have crept into our hearts, may have sneaked into our hearts. And then we must respond. We must respond by challenging the opponents of faith. And we must challenge their standards of morality and justice. Just on a personal note, as I'm leaving school and coming back home, I visited one of my professors for some Farewell advice. I'm going back to my homeland to serve my community. What advice do you have? A scholar, professor of the university, and someone who has visited the United States, visited the Western world and many other countries, has a global view. He said, you cannot continue to simply be challenged. You cannot continue to be on the defense all of the time because you have superiority on your side. You must challenge people to do better. You must challenge them to be better. The Prophet wasallam, he was not always on the defense. But his mission was the offense. It was to challenge mankind to rise to the occasion and to do better, to be better, to challenge their standards of morality and behavior, what was appropriate and what was not, what was becoming of the human being and what was animalistic in nature. Brothers and sisters, we cannot remain in the corner taking our lumps all of the time but we have to be ready to come out. Not in a, an aggressive manner, of course, but to challenge those around us to be better. So in the coming weeks, Bidni Ta'ala, we will discuss some of the lofty aims and objectives of our faith in hopes that we can carry them to those in our communities to challenge them to rise to a higher moral standard. We ask Allah subhanahu